Yeah, so I mean, it's important to keep in mind that uh, this story, that this sort of historical arc that I told happens in the context of the sort of the most successful organization of the union movement in American history, that um, coming out of the Great Depression, uh, sort of bolstered by very strong laws protecting workers' rights to form unions and bargain collectively, uh, and also the um, a very tight labor market caused by the war put unions in a position to expand uh, in you know very rapidly in the 1940s uh, into the 1950s, um, and so throughout this period from the 1940s through the 1970s or into the 1970s, unions are at their peak power in U.S. history. Um, an another important part of that trend is that really starting immediately after the war, but really continuing through the, the 1970s is a growing political backlash against the union movement. So there is a, a major revision of federal labor law um, just after the war, it's called the Taft-Hartley law. Um, that's what, the, if, if people are familiar with this, this is the law that allows states to pass right to work laws. So this is the, the um, the result of that. Um, we have one in Texas. That's that's why Texas is a. That's right. 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 So so Texas can do that because of the Taft Hartley law. Um, the by the 1950s. So in the mid 1950s, you see the rise of unions leveling off and starting to reverse and decline. Um, it's a very slow decline until the 1980s, when there's a really dramatic decline. Uh, in the 1980s. So what it means is that unions are still very powerful. Uh, unions are, you know, among the most, the most powerful and most visible sort of political actors in American society. Um, they, they, you know, and any major political leader pays attention to them and speaks to them. Um, and they, and so one of the, the, the goals of the civil rights movement um, which you know is is also largely led by union leaders, but by African Americans who are often in small unions, um, who are marginalized within the movement, um, who are trying to gain the attention and the support of the civil rights movement, and that's a struggle that runs throughout this uh, story. I think the the culmination of that, in some ways, is after the March on Washington, when the AFL CIO, the largest union federation really puts its support behind passing the Civil Rights Act. Um, it did not endorse the March on Washington, but in some ways because of the success of the March on Washington was sort of forced to do that. And, and Will, I wanted to put one, give you one other question as a framing question. And again, I want us to get to the teacher's questions. I see there's one from Joanne. If other teachers, please send us your questions. I know this is a topic you all cover in your classes. Uh, Will, as, as you know better than anyone, you know, the scholarship on civil rights has changed a lot in the last 20, 30 years from a focus more on um, traditional elite institutions, including the NAACP and others, to more, sort of, more of a grassroots focus. I wonder if you would you just sort of give your perspective on how you think about the integration between, if we could say, you know, a more top-down approach, a more institutional approach, and a more grassroots approach, how you bring that to your teaching and, and suggestions you have for that. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And, and it's true that there's been much more attention sort of getting beyond the, the main leadership, you know, there's sort of beyond King and, you know, that. Um, the, the sense that there is a sort of grassroots movement. There's been a lot of attention also to broadening the, the sense of what geographic sense of the movement, that it was actually a Northern movement as much as a Southern movement, um, and also the chronological sense of the movement that it, um, so my, my work, you know, traces it back to the 1940s. Other people have gone, you know, back to the 30s, even to, you know, sort of in seeing it as an extension of the uh, struggle against slavery, right? So to sort of think about the broad uh, terms of the movement. Um, I think one thing that I think actually that I've struggled with is actually another part of, I think the, the work that I've done is actually not so much to go beyond the primary movements, but to rethink who actually were the, the leaders, right? So, um, so for example, during the 1963 March, 
you know, it's often now rem remembered as Martin Luther King's March on Washington. He was not seen as the primary leader of the march. In fact, if you look, uh, Life magazine has a cover uh, of the magazine the day, the month after the march, and it's in the, the headline is the leaders, and it's A. Philip Randolph, the trade union leader, and Bayard Rustin, the primary sort of tactical organizer of the march, who in some ways, because he was very politically radical, he was a young communist, um, he was gay, and he this was seen as sort of by some civil rights leaders and some in the media as a sort of liability, a reason not to pay attention to him. Um, but at the time, they were recognized as the primary leaders of the of the march. And there's been some other, I think, you know, some of the the women who were involved uh, in the organization of the march. Uh, Anna Arnold Hedgeman, for example, is somebody who has completely forgotten by the history of the the movement. She was the only woman on the organizing committee of the march um, and was really a central leader. She led the National Council for a Permanent FEPC, which was the first African-American lobbying organization in Washington, DC. Um, so I, I think it's also a matter of recognizing that people who were actually seen as leaders at the time have often been pushed aside or forgotten. That's a really interesting point. Uh, and, and maybe certain people get remembered because they've been focused on and others have been forgotten. And, and one of the things we're doing is excavating those stories and, yeah. and bringing them out. Um, okay, so Joanne uh, Pappas has a question, Will. Um, it's about desegregation of schools and about how that came up in 1941 and the long train from there through Brown v. Board to 60 to 63 and beyond. It's something obviously we still struggle with, uh, schools yeah. that are quite, yeah. quite segregated. Please, other teachers, put your questions in the chat too. Go ahead, Will, sorry. Well, I mean, it's interesting that the segregation of schools was actually not a big issue in the 1941 march. I mean, it was, um, it was, it was a, you know, it was on the map of people, of civil rights leaders, but um, in, in many respects, I think that became an issue in part because of the, the success that, um, that emerged in, that would ultimately emerge in the Brown case. So. In, in so the Brown cases in 1954, um, that sort of organizing around the sort of cases that lead to the Brown case start to really pick up speed after the Second World War. It's also, I think, important to keep in mind the importance, the sort of increased importance of education after the Second World War, that um, it becomes an avenue for uh, economic success in a way that it wasn't actually in the before the war. Um, and so, you know, by the 1960s, there's a very widespread recognition that being shut out of decent education is, a, is, is really shutting somebody out of, of, of success in a way that that wasn't so true before. So I think that in part explains that shift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Joanne is commenting. It took 22 years from 41 for that to become an, an issue in that in that way with with the march in 63. Uh, Cameron asks, um, how, she makes the uh, observation that Martin Luther King Jr. used a lot, a ton, a ton of economic vocabulary in the speech uh, he delivered that day. Uh, she said she's just commenting, Will, that your your analysis yeah. helps her to see and understand understand that, right? Yeah, Once yeah, and I mean it's interesting also that he. So he, the, the speech that he gave, that was a written speech in which he gives a lot, he uses a lot of that economic uh, language. In many respects, that was the sort of speech that he felt like he had to give because he was giving it at this March for Jobs and Freedom. It was sort of really hammered away that to connect the economic and the racial. Um, he actually halfway through his speech threw out his script. And he went back to a speech that he has given, he had given over and over again. That was sort of his mainstay speech, the one, the I have a dream refrain, um, that that doesn't as much touch on economic justice. It's interesting, he actually gave that same speech to the AFL CIO a few years earlier, in which he really hammered home the economic justice message. But that actually is not a major part of the last half of his speech. And in part, it was he was sort of he was at, um, improvising by the time he got there. I mean, improvising on something that he had done a lot. And he and he knew that he needed a speech to sort of rile people up and send them home. And, and that's that's why that speech was so powerful. 
Sure. I, just while we're on this, I wonder if you want to say something about John Lewis's speech, which I think uh, is, is, is such an important moment also. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a fascinating story because he, um, so John Lewis was the youngest speaker, youngest official speaker at the march. He was speaking on behalf of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, he gave an incredibly radical speech um, that was, it was actually written kind of in uh, communally by the leadership of SNCC. Um, and the, um, the night before the march, they circulated it and it got into the hands of some in the press and some uh, of sort of the, uh, in the Kennedy administration. And so it sort of went, it went around Washington um, and several people were really angry at the, the, the tone of the speech. And he was actually convinced to tone it down a little bit. Um, I think there's a, my, when I tell this story, I remind people to actually go and listen to the speech and look at the speech he gave, because it's, it's still, a re, I, I think, one of the most incredibly radical pieces of rhetoric in American history. I mean, it's, he, 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 it's scathing. Um, it's not quite as scathing as the one he wanted to give. Um, and there's two important things that he changed. One is that SNCC did not support Kennedy's civil rights law. And the leaders of the March on Washington, primarily A. Philip Randolph and Baird Rustin, felt that they really had to say, we support this law, but we want more. Um, and so the original John Lewis speech says, we, don't, we can't support this. Uh, he, he changed that to say, we support it with great reservation. And then he went into all the limits of it. The other thing is that he um, initially planned to say, we need to march through uh, the South like Sherman did. Sherman, right, right. And burn Jim Crow to the ground. Yeah. And then he was going to pause sort of dot, 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 nonviolently. And <laughs> this was seen as just, you know, this was supposed to be a nonviolent march. There was a lot of concern at the march about violence, about people being attacked. In fact, the American Nazi Party showed up and harassed marchers and tried to provoke uh, uh, violence. And so leaders of the march said, you know, try, let's not include that reference in the, um, in the speech. But it still actually remained an incredibly powerful uh, speech. I, I agree, and, and, and Will is more the expert on this than I am, but I, when I was doing oral histories on this years ago, I was amazed how many people remember John Lewis's speech. It wasn't, yeah. just, it wasn't just King's speech. I think this comes to, I think, a question that Tomiko asks is, you know, how we depict this in textbooks. It is depicted as Martin Luther King's march, but part of what you're saying, Will, is it's really not Martin Luther King's march. He's one of many facets to this, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's interesting, I was actually really surprised writing the book, going back at looking the news at the news reports. And it was not at the time, you know, King, people remarked that King's speech was incredible, right? And that it was a very powerful speech, but he was not seen as the primary, uh, you know, force of the march. And actually his speech was not really seen as his most important speech. Yeah until after his assassination, so in 1968. Um, so I think now, I think the, the sort of, the, the, the way in which we remember it as King's March, and I think if anybody knows anything about the March, they know the I Have a Dream speech. Right. And I think what's actually really lost in that is that if you think about, King was the last speaker of 10 speakers his job was to send people home riled up, right. right? By the time he came to the stage, everybody knew what this march was about, right? Because the other speakers had said it over and over and over and over again. So nobody was gonna miss it. He didn't have to talk about the goals of the march. And actually after he ended, A. Philip Randolph and Baird Rustin came back on and let, read those lists of demands, right? So. It was very clear to anybody there what the march was about. But if we only know King's speech, we actually don't know anything about what the march was about. We, we get the sort of uplifting speech and tremendously powerful speech, but it doesn't really tell us what the march is about. And I think that's even more 
misleading as I think in hindsight, we've come to see that speech as the expression of the goals of the civil rights movement. Right. right? right. And it doesn't tell us very, it tells us nothing really about right. what the goal, I mean, it tells us in very superficial terms what the goals of the movement were. Right. And, and I think the stakes are large and I want us to get to the issue of poverty because, uh, and Vietnam, there's a question about that too, uh, because if you just remember the speech and just those words of the speech, the economic argument is lost. It's gone. It's still right. a powerful argument, but the economic side of it is lost. Be before we get to that, uh, Jared Hutchinson, uh, Will, has a question about the connection between civil rights and the desegregation of the military Truman's order in 1948. Yeah. Um, so one thing I kind of glossed over was that the two major demands of the 1941 march were the desegregation of the military and the, um, and the Fair Employment uh, Practices Commission. Um, that demand was, was actually not met by Roosevelt. And that was a very contentious issue. There was, when the March on Washington in 1941 was first planned, there were actually, there was a pretty vibrant draft resistance movement a young, among young African-Americans who were saying, we're not gonna fight in the Jim Crow army. Um, and that was actually the, the, in many respects, the, the, that was one of the two issues that really riled people up, right? Like, how can you, you know, so the arsenal of democracy is going to fight with a Jim Crow army, right? The, the contradiction was so glaring. Um, and A. Philip Randolph, when, when Roosevelt said, you know, call off the march and I'll give you essentially one of your two demands, that was a very difficult position. And A. Philip Randolph took a lot of flack for doing that. Uh, and so in part as a result of that, after the war, he was part of a really vigorous movement to push on the issue of desegregating the military. Um, and, um, and, and Truman doing that was, was seen as a really important sort of sign that Truman was, was on board uh, with those demands. So it's, it's a really important uh, part of that story. Um, it also meant that in after that, the, the demand for an FEPC, you know, they were always seen as kind of going hand in hand. And so winning one, I think, sort of ramped up the demand for the FEPC. And, and it's such an important point, Will, just as an aside, it's implied in what you said, Truman really needed the labor vote in 1948. Yeah. Truman was, was not on board, it seems to me, with, with civil rights in the way Johnson might have been. But Truman needed the labor vote. So your point about the importance of labor is, is crucial. Without labor unions pushing for desegregation of the military, I don't think it would have happened. Yeah, uh, yeah. At, at and time. he, and Truman vetoed the bill, that uh, the Taft-Hartley Act. Right. Um, it was passed over his veto, uh, but, but that, was a, that was, you know, one of the most forceful aspects of his administration was a veto of that, that law. So I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, I want to get to Denise's question on Vietnam last, because that's where we're going to go after spring break in our next lecture. But I wanted to ask a question uh, um, about, you had some very interesting and important insights on poverty and, and, and the anti-poverty programs. Um, to what extent was Johnson's Great Society in line with where uh, King and others in the civil rights, wanted to, civil rights movement wanted to go? And to what extent should we understand there being a difference between where Johnson was going with his anti-poverty measures, which you show were significant. I think all historians would now agree that fewer people uh, were in poverty. The gap was narrowed by those programs, uh, but were they what the civil rights movement wanted? Were they different? How do we understand that relationship? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's two important things to keep in mind uh, sort of when addressing that question. Um, one is that there's a great deal of variety within the civil rights movement about their views about the relationship between poverty and racial inequality between race and class. Um, there's important sort of class differences within the civil rights movement uh, that shape that. Um, the, and, and the way that I think that informed the relationship between the Johnson administration and the civil rights movement over the great society I think was in many respects, the sort of differences over the view of the effects of poverty on, um, on racial inequality, right? So there was a very strong uh, position among, within the Johnson administration, that's probably I think best characterized with, um, with uh, 
with Daniel Patrick Moynihan that um, that poverty has this sort of snowball effect of depriving people of the ability to get out of it, right? That there's sort of what, what Moynihan would have called it creates pathologies. Um, this was a position that was actually not alien to the views of many within the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Moynihan based those theories on many on the theories of many black social scientists, right? Um, so there were, and their position was that you could not simply eliminate poverty uh, by giving people more money or doing these sort of anti-poverty programs that you had to address the sort of lingering impacts of poverty. This was a very controversial position, um, not just within the civil rights movement, but among many liberals in the United States at the time. Um, and there was vigorous disagreement within the civil rights movement over that. Um, the Johnson administration tended to be on the side of people like uh, Moynihan, who would argue that you, you also need to attend to, and, and that in a sense, you can't really trust poor people to take care of their lives themselves. You have to do things sort of to, to lift them out of poverty. Um, this led to, you know, people have written about how this led to some pretty um, penal, like, criminal justice policies that were pretty dramatically, you know, sort of, uh, sort of cr clamping down on crime in ways that led to mass incarceration and things like this. Um, so these were differences between uh, figures, I think both within the civil rights movement and within the Johnson administration. The Johnson administration tended to be on one side of that. I think the other factor that's important to keep in mind is the war in Vietnam. Right. And, you know, I guess we're going that way, right? But um, but increasingly, people within the civil rights movement recognize that, in a sense, you can't fight the war on poverty and the war in Vietnam at the same time. And increasingly, the Johnson administration felt that they were going to sort of divert resources uh, into the war in Vietnam. Um, you know, King spoke out very strongly against this. Um, others within the civil rights movement sort of withheld their, their views. Um, you know, people like uh, like John Lewis and people in SNCC, you know, very early on were very critical of this uh, position. Um, so I think that, but that led to, uh, I think, a really major split. And I, I think in some ways it led to, you know, a split within the Johnson administration, maybe a split within Johnson himself, right? That, right. I mean, it was, he was very conflicted about this as well. Um, right. But that, that, you know, sort of undermine support within the administration for these policies. So, so this brings us to what I think will be our concluding question before we get to the, the document you shared. Uh, Denise Placencia asks about, uh, you know, the, the riff, as she calls it, I think appropriately, between LBJ and, and King, uh, to what, 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 what role Vietnam played in that and what the legacies were of that. Yeah, I mean, it certainly did. And, um, and like I said, I think, you know, there was a there, there, there was a pretty conscious decision made in 1964 by King and, and many others that, you know, Johnson was, you know, the best ally they had ever had, and they were going to do what they could to support him. Now, it didn't mean like completely withdrawing any support and or withdrawing any criticism of him, but to temper that criticism and be very, very um, cautious about that criticism, because, you know, in 1964, the alternative was Barry Goldwater. Right? And they all knew they didn't want very cold water in the White House. Um, and that position really carried, you know, carried through that as, especially as Johnson, you know, he, he was losing support in Congress. He was, um, he, he was increasingly losing, you know, popular support. Um, they felt that, you know, voicing that criticism of Vietnam could have a very negative impact on the civil rights movement, right? So they could be critical of it but they had to do it behind the scenes, you know, to Johnson, not publicly. Um, and so it did create a rift. Um, it also created a rift between King and, uh, and much of the civil rights leadership who continued to believe that they should not, you know, directly challenge uh, Johnson in public. So, um, it, it, um, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind how this is, itself, the civil rights movement is a broad coalition of people with very different views and very different politics and strategies. Um, and 
And this definitely made it difficult to maintain that coalition. I, I was thinking about just these issues, you know, reading the obituaries for Vernon Jordan today, who mm -hmm. arguably is one of the most influential African Americans in recent American history in the last 20 to 30 years, but he was definitely someone of the establishment. Uh, you, yeah. you didn't hear him criticizing Bill Clinton's uh, criminal justice policies at the time. I don't think he ever did, actually. Um, no. <laughs> but I'm guessing, I, I'm, I'm guessing he had some, I, I'm guessing he personally had some opposition, but he, he felt he had to work with the administration, I think. that, And it's a choice, it's a difficult choice people have to make, right? Right, right. And the closer you are to power, the more, you know, the more difficult those those choices become. Right. And, and that was in some ways, I think, you know, what characterized the civil rights movement in the late 1960s. Of, you know, they really were close to power. They had a win and the, the position that they had with the White House was remarkable if we think about, um, you know, even going back to 1941, it was a right, dramatic right. change. It, it's a big question today, because I think you could argue that this, right now we're seeing more uh, access to the White House for groups that haven't seen it for a long time, even going well before Trump. What, that, what, will, that, what will that mean? Will they become less radical? What, what will happen as a, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, speaking of power, though, Murphy has returned. So 